All right. Welcome everyone who is joining us via the recording. Um, we have a shared notes document. Uh, Jerry is has been and will again share that in the uh, meeting chat as we have folks joining in. Uh, so please sign in. And if you have a question as we go through the presentation, please feel free to flag it in the Zoom chat or on the shared notes document. There is a specific section for this, I think on page three at the moment. And we'll go through these questions and try and answer them after the presentation. Some ground rules and expectations as we begin. This session is designed as a place for learning and conversation. We ask everyone to be curious, to hold space for one another, and to be respectful as we want to build community and not tear it down. Um, you can see more about our expectations and ground rules in our code of conduct, the link to which is on the slides right now and accessible via our website as well. So before we talk a little bit more about the Open Infrastructure Fund, I'd like to introduce a bit about Invest in Open Infrastructure. Um, our mission is to increase the investment in and the adoption of open infrastructure to further equitable access and participation to research. We believe that for, the open, for open knowledge to flourish, our systems need to be similarly designed. And so a core part of our and principle of our work is to really advance a vision where open infrastructure is the default in research and scholarship. In terms of how we are uh, furthering this mission, we have a three-pronged approach. First of all, we employ a research-driven approach to uh, re help guide strategies and actions that are designed to increase adoption of and investment in open infrastructure. On top of that research, we provide resources analysis to hopefully help funders and uh, budget holders to assess, evaluate, and make investment decisions about open infrastructure. And last but not least, we are piloting solutions and coordinating stakeholders in the space, knowing that resources and research itself is not enough, right? But based, based on those research and uh, resources to um, convene and pilot solutions together with stakeholders to hopefully increase the sustainability of an open infrastructure sector to really further a shared agenda to make open infrastructure the default. What those three approaches look like in practice are, uh, this is very much work in progress and very new to me as well, as we work towards um, formalizing those in three core programs that we're working towards specifically uh, this year. We are focusing on infrastructures that are furthering open immediate access to content and data in line with some of the latest uh, declarations and communiques from the UNESCO Open Science team, uh, the Nelson Memo in the US, G7 communique, and the European Union, Euro European Union Council's guidance. Um, we are at the moment, as we speak, building out a fund, which we're calling 2024 Fund, to differentiate it a little bit from the Open Infrastructure Fund here. The aim for that is really to catalyze uh, larger amounts of investments um, and also to broaden, to diversify the pool of investors into open infrastructure to drive the adoption of open infrastructure so that we're building towards a healthy, resilient and sustainable future for research and scholarship. And uh, the work that you've seen so far and you will hear more about in terms of building and designing the open infrastructure fund is definitely feeding into the design for this 2024 fund. Um, accompanying that is something that we're tent tentatively calling the data room. Um, these are envisioned to be a set of tools for decision makers and funders that um, are research-based, but also that we hope institutions and funders can use and rely upon as they um, make decisions about their investment in open infrastructure, that those tools involve um, the catalog of 
open infrastructure services, which some of you may be familiar with, but also additional actionable reports and dashboards as well. Last but not least, um, we have some ongoing projects that has the specific aim of providing tailored strategic support to um, open infrastructure funders and open infrastructure service providers, namely uh, two ongoing projects, one with Archive, the preprint server in the high energy physics domain, and another with where to see which is um, an organization that is providing cloud open open cloud infrastructure services. Um, working really closely with these teams to look at you know governance and sustainability um, and ultimately with the goal of increasing their resilience and sustainability and furthering the adoption of open infrastructure. So if you want to find out more about these uh, core programs, you can visit our website or we're happy to answer questions on them as well. All right, with that, um, on to more about the Open Infrastructure Fund. So the aim of the fund is in line with our vision uh, to increase investment in adoption of open infrastructure. This fund really aims to strengthen the sustainability and resilience of infrastructures uh, that underpins research and knowledge creation. A quick overview of the fund itself. Uh, at this point, we are primarily focused on funding projects in three areas, in capacity building, in strengthening community governance, and in critical shared infrastructure. And I'll go into a little bit more depth about the three areas individually on, our, on my next slides. In terms of uh, where you are based, uh, practically anywhere in the world, there are a couple of exceptions that I'm happy to elaborate on, and that information has been updated on our website. Uh, the kind of something that is special about the OI fund this round is that 60% of the funds will be reserved for individuals, organizations, and projects in lower and middle income economies. You can apply for funding between 5,000 to 25,000 US dollars. And for projects that are of any duration up to two years, we envision the starting date to be between November 1st and December 31st this year. The deadline of applic for applications is the end of this month. As I mentioned, uh, now hoping to take a couple of minutes to go through in a bit more detail what each of these funding areas are. So in terms of capacity building, the ultimate goal is to improve the technical reliability and security of the open infrastructure services. And for us, this, uh, is, this includes a variety of activities such as creating and updating documentation to make it easier to onboard new contributors, maintainers and users to the infrastructure, training institutional staff and users on implementing or using a new or existing version of the infrastructure. And last but not least, organizing events to strengthen relationships or networks amongst contributors, maintainers, and or user communities. These are just some examples of capacity building activities, and we encourage you to be creative, to understand you know, what your infrastructure contributor, maintainer, and user communities need and to uh, propose work that is centered around those needs. In terms of the second area, strengthening community governance, this is really to uh, ensure that the infrastructure service acts in accordance with its values of openness, transparency, and accountability. And again, some example activities here include organizing community workshops to discuss governance needs and or to redesign governance structures where that's needed, to convene uh, dedicated committees, working groups of key stakeholders to lead work on, for example, diversifying governance and uh, any work that is on improving the governance processes. For example, you 
wish to have time and resources to review or evolve bylaws or other policies, or even to you know, increase visibility and make them public um, to develop new policies as well, that would all be within the scope of this funding area. Last funding area that is in this round of the OI fund is critical shared infrastructure. And this is really where we're hoping to advance efforts that would push people to collaborate directly across and work with existing systems. So examples, and they might seem quite different, but we see a lot of synergies between the two. Um, one example is if two open infrastructure teams work together, for example, um, across two different technical stacks to enhance the interoper interoperability between the two. Another example is uh, the adaptation and customization of some existing infrastructure services such that it could better serve uh, the needs of a local community. And that could include things like localizing in terms of language and translation. As, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are committed to carving out at least 60% of the total funds uh, in this round. So I believe that adds up to $78,000 in total for individuals, organizations, and projects working in low and middle income economies um, or, and or services that are widely adopted by communities in LMIEs. On the application form, you will find that there is a question and space for you to describe how you are meeting this criteria. Also to note is that we are accepting applications in both English and Spanish. And so you'll find uh, application form and budget templates in both languages. Um, and the review process will also be carried out in both languages. In terms of the application process, um, we are facilitating the application and evaluation processes through open review, which is an open source tool. Um, so in order to apply, you need to apply through the op our open review portal and you'll find the link to that, I think on the shared notes as well as on our website. If you are interested in applying, even if you don't go through with a final submission, we suggest that you register for an account on Open Review as soon as possible, knowing that it could take up to 24 hours for the Open Review team to approve your account. By submitting an application, you are also agreeing for your proposal to be publicly accessible and publicly reviewed. We um, have provided links to the application form templates uh, for drafting, and those are in both Google Doc as well as in Word document formats and uh, a budget template that you can download uh, and use that is available on our website. And I think all of those links are also in the shared notes document. Uh, those are for the, the Google Doc and the Word Doc templates are for drafting. You still need to copy and paste those answers into the open review portal. The budget template, you can download, use it, and then there is on the open review application form a space for you to upload that budget as a PDF file. Oops, sorry. Um, here it says we will be sharing a guide for applicants. We've actually already shared that earlier this week. And so please do head over to our website to have a look and I'll try and get a link into the shared notes document as well. It contains a few guiding questions that might help you think through um, and structure a good application. And we have been continuing to expand our frequently asked questions section on the website as well. So please do take a look um, before you submit the application. Some key dates, um, we are now on July 6th. So our final office hour session, the end of the month is the deadline for proposals and they are due by 
11.59, so midnight uh, UTC. We are hoping to notify all um, applicants of decisions in September. That might be subject to change depending on the number of applications we get, but that's what we're aiming for. And um, in November, this first, November 1st, this will be our expected payment date. Um, and that's also dependent on the due diligence process as well as the paperwork, but that's what we're, we're aiming for. In the next few minutes and the next few slides, I will talk a little bit more about how we plan to evaluate the proposals. Just noting that um, the evaluation is will be carried out by our uh, advisory panel, which we're currently putting together. Um, IOI staff, so myself, Jerry, and others included, we are not involved in the evaluation. Um, so the the panel will be looking at three areas to evaluate the proposal against, and we will be providing them with a rubric that is covers some of the points that we will be mentioning here. So first of the first area for evaluation is what we're calling the evidence of alignment. We're looking at how the proposed work align with one of the three funding areas, one or more, I should say, and uh, with IOI's goal to further equitable access and participation in research. We're specifically looking for whether the proposal has articulate, articulated clear objectives for the proposed work that are aligned with the funding priorities of this call. We're also looking for um, specific activities that are outlined within the proposal that involves users, supporters, and others in the project's community. Um, the third criteria is uh, looking at whether the work is open so whether the project concerns or works with not-for-profit, non-commercial platforms and services, and or employs open standards and protocols and encourages the use and reuse of content, data, and underlying code with minimal restriction. And the last uh, criteria within this category um, is that uh, we'd love to see proposals that present actions and strategies to reduce marginalization and further equitable access and participation in research. The second area that we'll be evaluating proposals for is on um, how on the kind of neglectedness or scarcity of funding for this work at this time. So we're interested primarily in uh, funding areas of work that have been traditionally hard to get funding for. And so we ask that applications convey the need for this project that uh, for the communities that the project serves and also demonstrates that uh, funding for this type of work or project is scarce or neglected. And last but not least, looking at feasibility and readiness as part of that evaluation process. Um, here we are, we will be looking at um, whether the project is feasible within the period of time that is established within the proposal, as well as the budget. And also, uh, we believe that a successful pro for a project to be successful, applicants need to ha have a careful understanding of the skills, resources, and the challenges that they may face for the project. And so we're looking for kind of clear demonstration of that understanding. In terms of uh, reporting, so this is after, you know, you have been granted an award. Um, we, re we are very aware at IOI uh, of the kind of burden that reporting on grants have on grantees. Um, and we are really striving to try to minimize that in, in this round of the OI fund. So 
what right now what we're planning to do is to ask all successful applicants to basically have a 45 minute check in conversation with a member or two of the IOI team every six months. In the call, we will um, we'll be uh, having kind of automatic transcription just so that we have that uh, documented. But in, additionally, we're interested in hearing more about what you've been most proud of achieving over the last six months and where you have faced challenges perhaps, or where you, um, you know, see a need to, for example, change some of the original plans of your work. So this is really, we're, we're hoping that this will be a space where we can have open, um, honest conversations uh, about how the project is going to celebrate what you have achieved with you. Um, and also for us to together learn where this kind of funding effort has been impactful, has been useful and where it's been challenging. In terms of if you, um, in the progress of the project, decides that you need to deviate majorly from the original proposal, you can also use these calls to communicate that or emails. So we're really trying to learn how to make this as easy as possible for all of us. I think that's all I wanted to say in terms of presentation. So thank you so much for listening as we head into this final month of uh, call for proposals. We'd really appreciate it if you can help us spread the word on this call and to get more people to apply. Um, we actually, I think, have a communications plan um, which contains newsletter, email template messages, etc., social media messages, um, and you can find the link to this comms, pla comms pack, uh, I think, on the top of page four at this point, and you can go ahead and adapt and reuse those messages to help us spread the word. Um, and our email address is M Emmy at investinopen.org and Jerry at Jerry at investinopen.org are on the screen. If you have any questions at any point, please feel free to reach out to us. We're, we'll try to respond as fast as we can. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, and see if folks have any questions. I see a few coming up on the notes document and I would encourage everyone to either put your questions on the notes document or in the Zoom chat. Uh, I would also add that feel free to ask questions in Spanish as well. Just bear in mind to give me a minute to listen to the interpretation in English and then I'll be able to hopefully answer it. Um, with that, uh, Jerry, do you wanna read the questions to me so that everyone can stop listening to my voice for a while? No problem. Thank you for that good presentation, Amy. So we have quite a number of different uh, questions on the shared notes document. And uh, particularly for today, the question to start with is, is the person who submits the application automatically the point of contact? That's the first question. Thanks, Jerry. And thank you for the question. Uh, the answer is no. We have um, there on the application form, there is a section where you are asked to provide details. So first name, middle name, I think if you have one and last names on, uh, on the various authors as well as the email address. So on the open review platform, uh, they're called authors, which are the same as applicants, just so you note. Um, and there is a separate question, I believe, lower, like further down on the form where it asks you specifically for the information regarding a point of contact. So preferably uh, that should be someone within the application team, but if there are reasons why that wouldn't be the case, you can also fill in someone else in that field. And it will ask you for a couple of pieces of key information that I can't remember from the top of my head, but it should be clear, hopefully, on the application form, as well as on the application form templates. 
Thank you, Amy, for that clarification. Uh, the second question uh, is asking in terms of applications, how many applications have we gotten so far? Uh, I am just looking into the portal 12. Um, but I would say, I would also caveat that by saying that I expect a lot more applications as we move closer to the deadline. So take that with a pinch of salt. And if you are interested in applying, please do apply. Thank you. So the next question would be in terms of how detailed does the budget need to be? Can you show an example or can you give an example of what you're looking for? Thank you. Yeah, I think we, could look at providing an example, although the difficulty with that is because the projects could be so diverse, it really depends on your project. Um, the level of detail, I think what we are looking for specifically from the budget is related to that feasibility element. So, whatever level of detail that allows you to convince the, pan the reviewing panel that your project would be feasible within that budget uh, would be the level of detail that you would need. Sorry, that was not very concretely helpful. I will, I will look into what we can provide in terms of an example and uh, try and put that up on our uh, website, so the FAQ. Um, section if we have that. I, I can't guarantee that at this point we can do it because of capacities and we're quite close to the, the deadline. But um, if I would also say, because Jerry and I are not involved in reviewing the, pro the proposals themselves, if you really want us to have a look at the budget before you submit it, feel free to send it to us. And we can give you some feedback. Um, probably open uh, open <laughs> open a, a, a door there but uh but yeah that's that's that is actually feasible so um yeah i would encourage you to think a little bit about what would demonstrate the feasibility of your project in terms of that budget and to go for that there is also a detailed list of what you can and cannot use the budget for um on the website itself and on the template Thank you. Uh, the next one would be in terms of, can a team of individuals apply if they are not offic officially affiliated with some organization and are located in different countries around the world? If so, how will the grant money be handled slash distributed? Thank you, great question. Um, in short, yes, you can apply as a team of individuals if you, none of you are affiliated with any organizations. Um, we would still rely on you having a point of contact and the point of contact would be the person who would be uh, eventually signing the grant agreement, for example, and then also be accountable for handling the funds. So, um, that is possible. Um, we would recommend that you do not, that we're not sending money to multiple places ourselves from, from our side, just because that dramatically increases our administrative burden. But we are happy to basically send one person or one organization the grant funding and then have that person or that organization be, you know, the, the point of coordination to further disperse that funds according to the budget and to who needs to have access to that fund for the project. I hope that made sense. Thank you, Emmy, for that clarification. Uh, the next one is can organizations or individuals submit more than one proposal? Yes. Great. So 
multiple entries into the Open Infrastructure Fund are, are welcome. Absolutely. The next one would be, uh, in our project, we work with sensitive data, health records. So it is not possible to open all the steps and access to our project. We open as much as we can, but uh, taking in mind that we need to safeguard sensitive information. Do you think this call is appropriate for us? Absolutely. Um, thank you for that question. And I fully understand and appreciate that, you know, working with sensitive health data shouldn't be, uh, you know, that data shouldn't be fully open. Um, there is, in, in the Netherlands where I'm based, we say, you know, as open as, hang on, as, as open as possible, as close as necessary. And that's also in line with the FAIR principles. And so um, I would encourage you to think about what parts of that data potentially could be open in terms of, for example, can there be anonymization or de-identification techniques that could be used on the final data? Can the... Um, source code of the infrastructure that you're working with be open, um, looking at any outputs that are not just the data itself from the particular project, could those be open? And most importantly, perhaps for, again, going back to those evaluation uh, criteria, how are you involving community of contributors, users, and supporters in the work? And so, Acknowledging that there are multiple dimensions of openness and limitations as to where things can be safely open, um, but also still thinking about how um, others, the, commu the broader community can be brought into the design and execution of that work would be what the key of what we're looking for here. Thank you, Amy, for that clarification, very good question. Uh, any other questions that we have? Perhaps maybe if uh, typing is, is maybe taking too long, or maybe it's easier to just verbalize, you can also just raise your hand and we can give you the mic and you. Hi. So you had mentioned that there were some uh, exceptions to countries where you couldn't fund, if I remember correctly. Could you clarify which countries? Because we are a team distributed across different countries. Uh, and so I wanted to know that. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for the question. And sorry, this has been a, a, a gradual update, if you will, to our call as we learn ourselves how to navigate the, you know, complicated political landscape, geopolitical landscape. Um, so at the moment, I would say um, basically the countries on this list are uh, countries that have been sanctioned mostly by North American and European countries, where uh, Basically, our unfortunately, our financial infrastructure do not support the transfer of funds to these countries. And these, I'm just trying to look up the list exactly, is uh, at the moment Russia, China, North Korea, and Cuba. Um, all the other countries, we will try our best to find where you know where it's not obvious. We will try to find our find a way to get the funding to you if the project has been awarded. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Any other additional questions uh, that may be coming from the floor are also welcome. Manisha, is your hand up again for another question? Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to hold okay. the time. So um, so you have three areas that you want to um, prioritize for funding. And I was wondering, like, if we cover more than one of those areas, 
do you think it's better for us to uh, split that into different proposals or like have one big proposal? That is a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, I think that decision is whatever is feasible within the uh, budget that, you know, the, the kind of budget bracket that we've set out. So, um, the one thing to note is that the proposals are not evaluated per area, if that makes sense. We're looking, all the proposals, regardless of which area they go into, are evaluated exactly the same way in terms of alignment to one or more of the three areas of funding, right? And so um, I think here the consideration is then you know what's feasible within the budget that is the budget and time that is allowed for a single project um and so you know if you want to split it up that potentially mean you have access to you know twice the amount of funding that you could get across the two different projects right whereas if you combine it then the maximum is kind of $25,000 um I hope I answered that question. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Manisha. Uh, additional questions before we finalize on the session. One last time. But also in case uh, maybe the, the question, another question comes up maybe after this call, as we had referenced earlier in the presentation, you can also be able to just drop us an email and we'll be happy to respond to also any inquiries that you may have about the, the Open Infrastructure Fund. Uh, it seems as though that uh, we, we don't have any additional questions as of now. So maybe I just want to say thank you for all of you for attending this session and we look forward to receiving your proposals in terms of the different initiatives that you'd want supported and hopefully collaborating more further down the road so thank you and i wish you all a lovely day thank you very much everyone